Hello, everyone. Um, I think that you should all be joining us now. Uh, you should be able to hear me OK. I'd like to start by welcoming you to this online information session for the Advanced Diploma in Local History. Now, my name is Matthew Kidd, and I'm the course director for this course. I'm going to start with a short presentation where I'll outline some of the details of the course. There'll be a time for questions uh, at the end when I'll do my best to answer them. If you don't get a chance to ask a question, please do feel free to email us. Of course, we will be happy to answer you after the session. As you can see on the screen now, please do submit your questions via the Q&A function in Zoom. So I want to start just by talking a little bit about myself. This won't take long. Um, I'm the course director of the course for this year. I am a social, political and intellectual historian by background. Uh, I was awarded a PhD at the University of Nottingham in 2016. Now I'm primarily interested in 19th and 20th century English history, particularly how ordinary people um, inter interpreted political movements, parties, ideas, and identities at the local level. So my first book uh, looked at the prehistory of the British Labour Party. I was looking at some of the Victorian movements that, and, and ideas, I suppose, that fed into and helped shape the British Labour Party in its formative years at the local level. But since then, I've become much more interested in, in topics like memory uh, and themes and methodologies like oral history. So trying to see how we can tease out quite complex ideas in what look like on the face of it non-political oral history projects where people are just sharing their views on uh, this that and the other. Now I've taught in the department for continuing education since 2019 um, but I've also worked in different departments at Oxford running digital humanities projects mainly focused on collecting stories and artifacts around the first world war and the second world war. Most recently I was project manager for their finest hour which is a project uh, that we're proud to say managed to digitize over 25,000 objects from the Second World War that most people have just had in their cupboards and their lofts and, and places like that. Um, away from work, I love being outside. I like walking in the countryside, in the woods, gardening. Uh, at the moment, that means I'm getting soaked by the rain. Um, I suppose living in England means that's that's a common occurrence. Um, but I've dried myself off uh, for you for you today. Now. Before I move on and, and start talking about the course, I should say that I am just one member of the team here. You will get to meet the tutors for this course if you become a student. So we have several tutors of work on this course, all very experienced local historians. We've all published widely in the field of local history, and they've been involved in teaching on the advanced diploma for several years. Like I said, they're very experienced. They're also very friendly. So hopefully if you if you do decide to join the course next year, you'll have a chance uh, to meet them. So I'm going to start talking a little bit about the course now. The key facts that you really need to remember is that, well, firstly, the ADLH, as we like to call it, is a part time course and it's taught over the course of one year. Now, it's delivered entirely online, so there's no need for attendance here in Oxford. The course is due to start in late September <clears throat> 2025. Now we usually start around the third week of September. The course is aimed at the equivalent of the third year of undergraduate level. Now it's the technical equivalent of what we call the FHEQ level six, but that's effectively the same as a third year undergraduate degree course. Now who's the course for? Well, anyone. We have a wide range of students who study on this course. Our only real criteria is that we'd like you to have a interest in local history, a, a passion for it. So we don't expect you to have any formal qualifications in local history. You might never have studied history formally before, and that's absolutely fine. But we do want to see that you have an interest in the subject. And what does that mean? Well, it could mean that you're a uh, volunteer at a local history site, maybe an English heritage site or National Trust if you're in the UK. You might be a volunteer at a local archive, library, study centre, museum. You might be a member of a history society, maybe a local or national history society such as the Historical Association. Or maybe you just like to visit places that have local history connections. 
um, you're, you're familiar with maybe the history of buildings or people in your localities. Again, that's the kind of thing we're looking for, not formal qualifications. Now, just to give you an example, at the moment, uh, on, on this year's course, we have students from a wide range of different backgrounds, um, also a wide age range. So we have some students that would have just left school. They want flexible ways of continuing their studies and that interest that they have in local history, but maybe don't feel that they want to go um, and do a full undergraduate program at a university. We have many students who are working or who have caring responsibilities, and they're looking for some study alongside what, what they have to do. But we also have many students who are retired, uh, and many of them are looking to return to history. Maybe it was a first love that for one reason or another, they had to put aside, but now they want to return and really get back into it. But we also have Finally, those who feel that they've grown to love history, perhaps they've moved to an area and they've really got into it and, and tried to um, understand the place that they live, maybe some of the people that used to live there, and they want to explore more and, and maybe get some knowledge about methods and methodology that can help them do that. Now, the great benefit of this course that it's delivered online, entirely online, is that it's open to students anywhere in the world. So we have lots of students who currently join us from various different countries in various different time zones. Now, over the last two to three years, just as an example, we have students. For, we've had students from India, Kenya, the USA, the Middle East. Um, and, and that's great. And it really does contribute to making this course something special. Now, finally, just to reiterate, this may be your first experience of university study. That's absolutely fine. So how is the course structured then? Well, the course itself is divided into two modules. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the modules in a moment. <clears throat> Firstly, I just want to say that the modules are broken down into what we call units. Each unit of the course includes reading material that's delivered to you in a number of different ways. There are different exercises within each unit. There are different resources within each unit unit and we also include lots of suggestions for further reading. Now the course is actually delivered via an online learning platform that some of you may be familiar with and it's called Moodle. If you've taken online courses before you may, you may have heard of this. Now each unit which is released um, intermittently to you so you don't get to see everything to begin with it would be just like going uh, and having lectures you don't get told what the lectures are uh, immediately but what happens is when you get into that unit you get these materials and there's also a discussion forum where you can go in and engage with other students in your tutor group and also engage with tutors you can talk about the topic you can talk about the readings you can talk about anything that you've basically learned in that unit. Now, I mentioned tutor groups there. So if you become a student, you'll be allocated to one tutor group. Usually we have about three or four tutor groups per course. And that tutor group will be the primary route through which you discuss the material. You'll be discussing the materials with your tutor and others in your particular tutor group in an online forum. Now, when you're a student, you'll also have general forums where you can talk about issues with, with students from across the course. So it's not just in your tutor group. So there is the ability to talk to other tutors, myself and other students. We also have a common room. This is a more informal forum where you can discuss general things of interest. Maybe you've come across an interesting documentary, an interesting website that you think others will be interested in, or perhaps you'd like a discussion about. So the idea is we really encourage you to get involved, start chatting with people um, about the units and anything local history related. Now, each week there is an online tutorial, which we call our chats. They're much more informal than uh, a tutorial that you might encounter at Oxford. Now, at present, these take place via an online chat forum. So these tutorials take place on an online chat forum. Now, we are looking at possibly changing that format, but at the moment, that's how it happens. On top of that, we have an optional monthly study skills seminar, which I lead. 
This isn't compulsory because this would be a video call via Microsoft Teams. And we recognize that students, obviously, if they're in different time zones, they may struggle to attend. But the idea of these seminars is that we will introduce you to things like essay writing, time management skills, how to respond to feedback that you get from tutors, the nuts and bolts, you could say, of the course, and more generally of studying history at a university. So if you are very familiar with those things, you don't necessarily need to attend, but we're also aware that many people who join the course would really benefit from, from being told a lot about this stuff and, and being given tips and advice on, on how to improve, for example, writing essays. Now, as I say, they will be run via Microsoft Teams. They are recorded and those recordings will be available to you. So even if you can't attend for one reason or another, you'll also you'll definitely have access to them. But let's talk about modules. I, I mentioned modules and I want to return to that now. You can see here on the screen that there are two different modules. The first one looks at the concepts and the methods of local history. This module covers subjects like how did local history come into being as an academic subject? What is the history of local history? We take for granted now perhaps that there is such a thing as local history and there are people who are studying locality and regions uh, and towns and cities. But that came into being at a certain time and we'll, we'll give you some background on that. This module will also encourage you to look at how different scholars approach the subject. As some of you may already know, historians are always debating and disagreeing on lots of things. And it's the same in this field. How do their approaches to the study of local history differ? And are there different schools of thought? The answer is yes, by the way. What types of evidence also do local historians use? This is really crucial. I mentioned earlier that I'm interested in oral history. Well, there are some historians that don't think that that is the most, uh, the most, I suppose, satisfactory way of, of encountering the past. So there might be other sources you look at, personal testimonies. Are they visual sources, written sources? You could have diaries, letters, memoirs. So there's so many different sources that you can use and you'll be introduced to. For this course, and it is, I think, really something that makes it stand out from other courses, is the fact that we really look at the role of statistics and the use of statistics in developing maybe the history of a, of a town or a region. We look at lots of databases, spreadsheets, and increasingly, probably when you join the course, things like AI. And then finally, we will be thinking about in module one, writing about and publishing local history. How do we present local history to the public? That's also very important. Now, I mentioned just then that we, we look at things like databases. Module two is really set aside to do a deep dive into the use of databases for local historians. This forms a really core part of this course, because as local historians, you're going to be faced with large quantities of data that requires analysis. You may, for example, like, like my mother's really keen on doing this in building up the family history, going back as far as she can, building that family tree. Now, if you're familiar with doing something like that and you've explored the sources online or offline um, that will enable you to build that family tree, you'll know that there is so much information and often you'll be looking through large databases, census records, huge data sets containing information about people's names, their occupations, dates of birth, maybe their earnings, all kinds of information. And when we look at individual entries, in these databases, it tells us about maybe that individual, but it doesn't tell us much about uh, the locality. But when you start to put all that information together and, and move it around, you can really start to build up a picture of a local area. You can see, OK, what kinds of people lived in that area? How did that change over time? What were they doing? And how do social relationships work in that community, maybe between employers and workers, for example? That is what we're going to be covering in module two. One of the questions that I'm sure many of you have is, how am I assessed? What do I actually have to do and submit? Well, I should say, firstly, that in terms of what we expect from you, we recommend that 
you'll need to devote around 15 to 20 hours a week to study on this course. Now that will vary from person to person. It might even vary over the duration of the course. It's likely that as you're starting to get to grips with the way the course is delivered, the way Moodle works, for example, it might take you a bit longer. Um, it might take up much more of your time in the first few weeks. As you get more familiar and as you get into the routine of the course, you will then maybe take less time. You may also find some units are slightly more challenging than others. You may be familiar with one area, but not another. Therefore, you maybe need to do a bit more reading around the subject. So there's going to be variances, but generally we suggest spending around 15 to 20 hours a week uh, on the course. Now, in terms of assessment, you're going to need to produce five written assignments on questions that will be set for you. They vary in length, and we're talking maybe between 1,000 and 3,000 words each. And then you'll submit those assignments to us as a Word document through an online learning platform. So it's, again, entirely electronic. Now, for assignment five, you will need to design and analyze your own database. Now, please don't be scared. As I've just said, module two will take you through how to do this. We'll look at it step by step. You'll know exactly what's required and you'll have support, like I said, from tutors and other students, myself and various other resources. Assignment six, which is the final assignment, is really what most students enjoy and what they look forward to the most. This is essentially a local history project. It's a longer assignment of 5000 words and you get to pick the topic. You negotiate that topic and the question that you can set with your tutor. So again, this isn't a set question that you have to go off and write 5,000 words on. You pick the topic. You can write on anything of interest to yourself as long as it relates to local history. Now, you've probably noticed that our course has local history in the title. But if you've looked around the department's website, you'll see that many other courses have the word English in the title. Now, the reason for this is because we recognize that many students who join this course join from anywhere in the world and maybe don't want to limit their focus to England. So when it comes to assignment six, you can study the history of your locality or any locality in the world. We've got one student on the course at the moment that's already expressed an interest in taking the tools that she learns from the course to do uh, assignment six on her local area in southern India, looking at the agriculture and agricultural workers in that part of the world. That's absolutely fine. And it's going to be fascinating to read that. So as long as you apply the principles that you learn on the course to the locality, region, town, city that you're interested in, then that's absolutely fine. The world is your oyster in this sense. Now, I'd just like to mention that the course content that you'll be offered in module one and in module two will primarily focus on English history. So even though you have a lot of leeway on assignment six, what you're going to be shown through the online learning platform is mostly related to English history. That's where our expertise is and that's where our tutor's expertise is. But the final assignment obviously can, can break from that. Now, you may all be pleased to hear um, that there is no written exam. There's no written examination. All the assessments will take place through these assignments where you go away, you spend as much time as you, you can on building up an argument through, through assignments. So what about life at Oxford University? Now, this is an online course. So many of you won't um, visit Oxford during the time that you're studying here. But I should say that you still have the opportunity to take advantage of so many and numerous resources that all students at Oxford benefit from. Now, the major one benefit, I think, really is accessing Oxford University's Bodleian Libraries. And it's plural because the Bodleian Libraries is actually a group of 26 different libraries that serve the university. This is one of the largest, if not the largest, academic library service in the UK. And just to give you some idea of how big the libraries are, um, in total, the libraries hold more than 13 million printed items. Obviously, because this is an online course, we're going to give you suggestions and encourage you to use uh, the, the what you call ebooks or electronic resources that 
Oxford has to offer. And you'll be able to access that content through something called Solo, which is Search Oxford Libraries Online, Solo. That's your pathway to exploring all of the online and digital content that Oxford has to offer. You will access it from your laptop, your computer, your tablet, even your phone if you want. And through Solo, you as a student will have access to over 1.4 million ebooks, 118,000 academic journals, and 1,700 different databases and online repositories. Now, I'm saying that because it's impressive. I don't mean to scare you. There is no expectation that you need to read that many books or journals, but I just want to give you some idea of, of one of the benefits of working on an online course at Oxford. Now, as I said, we will suggest what books and articles we really do recommend that you read, but the great thing is you can go off and explore anything you're interested in through Solo. Now, on successful completion of the course, you will be invited to the annual awards ceremony, which will be held at Oxford Sheldonian Theatre. So there is an opportunity for you to come to Oxford at least once, if you would like to. Now, whilst you're at Oxford, there are also lots of support systems available to you. So don't feel like because you maybe won't be coming to Oxford, you can't benefit from all the support systems that we have here. So if you have issues that maybe you think might affect your studying, you can tell the department's student support team. You'll be linked up with a student support officer who can draw up a student support plan with your tutor. Now your tutor and the course director will be made aware of any issues that maybe will affect your studies and we will make adjustments to make sure that you, you, uh, you can work uh, as per normal. You also have access to various IT services that can help you with IT related issues and so on. So like I said, there's an endless list of different services available to you. Now, finally, and this is the last slide before we start looking at some of the questions you may have. Um, if you do want more information, obviously this is a relatively short session, but if you have more questions, you wanna find out more and you want to explore for yourself, we have a course website, which you should be able to see the, the uh, website address for on the screen. If you have more particular questions that you don't feel like the website answers, you can email us. You can watch the recording of this presentation, obviously. Uh, again, if maybe you missed something, we have a social media platforms, as you can see here. But generally, I think the best thing to do would be look at the website. If it doesn't answer your question, get in touch and, and one of us will respond. Now, I should say applications for the next intake are open now. And the deadlines have been set as the 13th of February, 2025 and the 1st of May, 2025. So there are two deadlines for you to meet. And we do encourage you to apply by that first deadline, just so that your place is confirmed sooner and there's less ambiguity about whether you're, you've been accepted or not. But it's up to you, you've got two deadlines to meet. Now, this is the first information session that we'll be running, and we are intending to hold further sessions closer to those deadlines. They're gonna be a bit more conversational. So at the moment I'm talking and you can write questions, um, but there's no, there isn't really a two-way interaction. Those sessions are going to be a bit more informal and conversational where uh, you'll be able to see me, for example, and I'll see you. But like I said, those dates are to be confirmed. If you check the website regularly, you'll, you'll see them when they pop up. Um, now, that's the end of this part of the presentation. But I'd now like to invite you, if you haven't already, to ask some questions via the online chat. So I'm just going to turn off my presentation so we have 10 at the moment and i'm going to uh, go through one by one so okay how long are the tutorials and how many in each tutor group okay that's from chrissy thank you the tutorials so the weekly tutorials um usually last for an hour or so um there is obviously no obligation on you 
to attend. It may be difficult for you to attend if you're in a different time zone, for example. Um, but they're usually around an hour long. The meetings normally um, are held UK time. They're not set, I should say, and they will vary between tutor groups and courses. Again, we try to be flexible here. So firstly, we try to organise the groups so that students from a particular time zone are in the same group. So when it comes to discussing with your tutor, when would be best to have a tutorial, maybe Mondays at 6 p.m. GMT, that will hopefully allow uh, many people within that group to join. Um, I should also say that you'll be able to read the transcripts of those meetings. So because it's an online chat, we will make those available to you. Um, so if for whatever reason you can't join, you'll be able to see everything that was said during the tutorial. We do encourage you to attend as many sessions as possible, but we understand that some of you will have jobs and commitments and lives. Uh, so if your question was you, you asked because maybe you can't commit longer than an hour a week to, to, um, to these live sessions, then that's absolutely fine. We understand that you won't be able to always do that. How many in each tutor group? That's a very good question. Sorry, Chrissy, I, I missed that one. Um, it depends on, on how many we get, uh, how many applications we get, we get. At the moment, we try to limit it to around 30 per group just to make it manageable. Um, but it really does depend on, on how many we get. But 30 is, is the baseline figure. Next one, Julia. Can the final project involve a digitization project of archival resources? Yes, absolutely. Um, as long as it ticks every other box for that project, um, i.e. it's focused on local history, then absolutely. And that's something we really encourage. Again, because this course is online, we are all big fans of and have been involved in digitization projects. So yeah, go for it. That sounds, that sounds fascinating. There are so many digitization projects out there that are focused on a specific locality. Um, and we definitely encourage you to, to explore those. And it'd be great if you did do your final assignment on that. Chrissy, my project is based in Scotland. Will that pose a problem when it comes to source materials databases? No, absolutely not. We talk very much about England in this department, but so much of what you'll learn is uh, relevant, obviously, to, to, to Scotland. Um, but no, it won't, it won't cause a problem. And again, with that assignment six, you'll be able to focus on the particular area of Scotland that you're particularly interested in. Um, but no, there will be no problems when it comes to source materials or databases. And again, like I said, through Solo, you'll have access, free access to so many of those. Julia, is local history the same as the history of a specific locality? What's the key difference between local and just general history of a town? Well, that's a very good question and one that will be answered and discussed in depth on the course. Um, I think that from my own perspective, the, the general history of a town, say like you wanted to write a book saying, here's the history of Oxford. That is an example of local history, but it is just one example of, of many. So for me, my view is local history is, is, a, is an umbrella term that covers that kind of thing, i.e. a general history of a town. But so much of local history is about either something much more specific, the history of a building, the history of a particular society, organisation, group within a locality, things like that. But it could be slightly more general. You could actually have the general history of a region, for example. Um, but no, it's a really good question. And, and one of those questions that would be great in our what we call our general common room, which is um, if somebody has a thought like that, they'll put it out there and then suddenly there'll be this huge discussion of people discussing, debating. And that's really how I think you learn on this course is through that. Um, Terry, is it possible to undertake the course focusing on one period only? Answer. Um, it's, it's natural that anyone that joins the course is interested in a particular period. I'm very much a modern historian. Some of our tutors are early modern historians. So it's, it's natural that you're going to be leaning towards maybe being more interested in uh, certain aspects of the course. 
in terms of undertaking the course of focusing, you will have to engage, for example, if you are interested in early modern history, you are going to have to engage with stuff about modern history. So in the, the units, you'll be uh, encouraged to look into resources, uh, readings and so on that focus on a wide range of, of different periods. However, what we suggest is take what you can, take what you want from that, mainly things like tools and analysis, and then really let go in, in assignment six and think, right, I've been waiting for this. I've, I've picked up all of these tools. I've looked at modern history, early modern history, um, medieval history. Now I'm going to apply all those tools to this specific area and this specific period that I'm so passionate about. And that's where the flexibility really comes in. But if you're asking, oh, actually, I don't want to look or engage with anything to do with the modern period. No, I'm afraid that it doesn't have quite that complexity. Uh, Brecker, for the final assignment, still on English history, would research on the British colonization um, in Cameroon, Africa, where I'm based? Yes, <laughs> is, is the answer to that question. That would be fascinating. Um, and like I said, it's about taking the tools, the knowledge, the expertise that you gain throughout the modules and applying it to whichever locality you want, including, like you say, the Cameroon. Um, oh, sorry, the British colonization of, of Cameroon. Absolutely, that's fine. Just to go back, Terry came back and said, is it possible to know the tutor specializations in advance? Yes, absolutely. Um, I believe that on the department's website, you can find academic staff profiles. So if you go and have a look there, you'll see what everyone's interested in, every tutor and lecturer um, is interested in. And so you can start to get a sense of, of, of the kinds of things that uh, you'll, you'll be being taught. Um, Rod, what are the progression routes after successful completion of the diploma? That's a very good question. So there are a variety of different courses here within the department, some of which would be a natural um, next step, I think, after you've completed this course. So, for example, we have an MSc, a master's degree in English local history. Now, that's a postgraduate qualification. So that's a slightly higher level than this course. However, you should know that that's an in-person course and it's taught over two years on a part-time basis. Now that would require attendance in Oxford. So that's not gonna be completely online and there are weekly classes for that. So if, if you're able to, that is a natural next step and it's, it's a great course. There are further studies at Oxford. Um, for example, there's a postgraduate certificate in historical studies. Now that's a kind of halfway house between an undergraduate degree and a postgraduate degree that's delivered over the course of one year. Again, that requires in-person attendance at Oxford. Then if you complete that, you're able to go on to study for the MLIT, uh, another master's course, again, delivered in person in York, Oxford over the course of the year. So like I said, there are, there are several options for you within the department, but that doesn't mean that you have to necessarily stay in the department. You could maybe find relevant courses as next steps at other universities. So some of our students have gone on to do online master's degrees at, for example, the University of Lancaster, the University of Edinburgh. So there's plenty of options for you, both within the department, maybe within Oxford more broadly, and then uh, within other universities. Alan. You have four questions. You've been very cheeky and put four questions in one. That's absolutely fine. One, fees. Does the tuition fee have to be paid up front or can it be paid during the course? I'm going to ask my colleague Hazel to answer that. I believe she can hopefully answer that within the chat. Um, or you can answer it vocally, uh, Hazel, if you, if you can. Okay. Um... The fee can either be paid up front or you can pay it in free, equal, termly instalments. That's the options available. Thank you. That, that's great. Um, number two, Alan, references. The importance of both referees being from an academic background. Can one be academic, the other one from work? 
there is no expectation that your references, your referees need to be from academic backgrounds. As I said earlier, we don't expect you necessarily to have academic qualifications. So some of those people that applied for the course won't have an academic referee. We do ask you to supply two references and they can come from different contexts. You could have um, someone from an educational context, so not just academic, uh, just more broadly educational, maybe a work reference, someone you've worked for or with, perhaps someone you've worked for or with on a voluntary project, maybe a volunteer coordinator, for example. So yes, in answer to your question, no expectation that one or two have to be from an academic background. Three, books. Is there an online shop where all the titles can be purchased? Well, better than that, most of them, most of the ones that we will tell you or encourage you to read, I should say, would, will be free to access. So you don't even need to buy them. Um, if you do want to buy the physical copies, um, I don't believe through Solo, I don't believe um, the Body and Libraries has a shop per se. Um, but there'll definitely be links across the website telling you where we encourage you to, to go to buy them. But very much this is an online course and we encourage you to use online and free um, resources where possible. And luckily at Oxford, probably more so than many other, or well, most universities, you will have free access to, to like I said, millions of, of different things that uh, are really useful. Finally, number four, what time of the day are the weekly online chats and optional monthly study skills seminars held? That was quite difficult to say. The weekly online chats will be held at a time that is most convenient to a tutor group. So one of the first things you'll do after registering as a student and after the course starts is having a chat with others in your tutor group and your tutor to pick a day and a time that's most suitable, that, that, that manages to... Um, capture as many people within that tutor group as possible. So there is no set time. I can give you an example of today, for example, um, what's happening right now on the course. Most of the tutor group sessions are held on Mondays or Tuesdays at between about 4 and 6 p.m. British time. So that tends to work for people who work uh, maybe during the day, uh, and maybe have various other commitments during the day. And it also allows some people in different time zones maybe where that's early morning for them. But there is no set time. The study skills seminars um, are usually held similarly, and we've got one tomorrow actually, it's gonna be held between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. British time. Um, now there are, there are three of those sessions and they're all gonna be held at roughly the same time. So that's not one where we will have a chat and try and negotiate. They're at a set time, but they'll be recorded. So even if you miss it, you'll be able to watch it. Catherine, you mentioned that the course begins around the third week of September 2025. When does the course end? And does the course run continuously or does it align with school, university terms and holidays? That's a very good question. Um, I can find the exact date because we're in the midst of the course. I'm not thinking yet about the end of the course, but just to give you some idea um, of this year, the last release of the unit, so unit six, module two, which is the last time you'll see a unit coming out, will be released on the 23rd of May next year. Um, well, it'll be 2026 if, if you join the course. You'll have an assignment, that assignment six, that really fascinating local history project, that one will be due around the middle of June. And I think generally you'll get your marks back around the middle of July. So if we see the course is officially starting in mid to late September, you'll get your final marks for your final assignment in the middle of July. Now in answer to your second question about maybe breaks within the course yes there is there's a there's a christmas break so just to give you a, an idea module one for this year runs from late september through to mid-december then you have a break right through to um for this year the 10th of january and then it's pretty consistent right through um like i say until may i hope that answers your question 
the dates might slightly differ next year of course but generally that's how we try to um, try to plan it Rebecca hello from Australia with the recommended reading list should we purchase and read these in advance um you can but it will cost you money um it's it's entirely up to you I don't we don't recommend it um because we don't want you out of pocket uh, and we do provide you with the free resources um when, when you join the course but it's entirely up to you are these expected to change at all i don't think they're all going to change but it's inevitable that new history books and articles are being released constantly and then maybe the addition of maybe uh, a more recent work that's that's come out maybe this year or even comes out early next year that we think oh we really need to make sure students read this so there might be slum, some changes sorry but those core texts, the ones that have been really influent influential historically in really shaping the study of local history, probably won't change. How familiar do we need to be with both Excel and Access? You will pick up some skills on those, obviously. I would say that it would be good to have a, at least a basic knowledge of how Excel and Access work. If, if you don't have any knowledge at all, um, then you may struggle early on. Uh, when we start doing module two in particular but again something i really want to shout about is the resources you have here at oxford there are so many training opportunities where you can really pick up skills on those kind of things and it will be something you can work on with with your tutor do we need to purchase access now i may be jumping the gun here um and it's something i'd need to look at but you may have access to some of the microsoft office software through your membership of Oxford University so I'd need to double check that um, and if you are really keen on that like I say email us after and we can get back to you but I think things like Excel, Access, Word you may be given access to through membership of the university. Do we get to decide whether to create the database for assignment five in Excel or Access or is this set? Thank you for your time. I believe that you have the opportunity to use either um, as long as you can justify why you've chosen one rather than the other. Um, that's absolutely fine and obviously I should say we're not it, although we do push Microsoft to Oxford there are other services available um, Nicole can we cover any time period if you're referring to in assignment six yes that's yeah that's the answer to your question um, yes absolutely obviously the units and the content of the units that would be released to you will be on set different times. Um, but like I say, when you have that flexibility and, and, and leeway to really focus on the topic of your own, um, something that you're passionate about, then yes, you can do any time period. Rosemary, does the final project have to include creating a database? Uh, no, I don't believe it does necessarily. It's not about creating a database. Um, that's more assignment five. But in assignment six, we would encourage you to use all the skills that you've learned across the course, um, one of which is uh, databases. But it may be that you're analysing an existing database rather than creating one from scratch. Valerie, what database software packages does the course use? I think we've kind of answered that question, but um, the ones that we would mostly encourage you to use just from the get go is things like Access, uh, Microsoft Access. But if you have familiarity with or access to other platforms that, that do similar jobs, then we're absolutely fine with that. So we're not too prescriptive on that side of things. Um, I'm just going to whiz through and see if any of you have come back to ask another question. I don't believe you have. Um, so I think, oh, bang on 12.45. That's, that's <laughs> perfect timing. Um, like I keep saying, if you have any further questions, please do email us. The website does offer you a lot of information already. But for the meantime, thanks for attending. I want to hope, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Um, I hope that we get to meet some of you next year. Um, and yeah, as I say, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye for now. And um, hopefully we'll see you again. Thank you.